Tonight is the Idaho Trails Association Trail Master Series on backcountry safety. And we are fortunate enough to have uh, kind of three experts with us this evening. Paul Holly from the Idaho Rescue Training, um, Whitney Allgood LaRufa from Alda and um, some other hats, and Evan O'Neill from Idaho Fishing Game, who will be talking to us about some bear safety. First off, we're going to do um, just a couple of quick announcements and to talk a little bit about what Idaho Trails Association is all about. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation has created a brand new trail supporter program. This rolled out on National Trails Day, which was in the beginning of June. Um, this is a voluntary donation-based initiative to hopefully help secure more um, much-needed funds for non-motorized trail maintenance in Idaho. Um, there's a couple of links here that will uh, give you some more information about the program and a link on here that you can um, go to to buy a sticker. And really, it's a $10 or more donation, and that will go to um, different organizations um, to help cover the cost of obtaining non motorized trails. So, um, I should probably do a little bit of housekeeping before we really dive in. So everyone probably has their microphones muted. And if at any time you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. And also um, you can raise your hand, but we will uh, probably just field questions after each of the speakers has gone through and done their presentation and open up for questions. And this presentation will be recorded. And so um, we'll put up a, a post on our YouTube channel um, that you can get to those recordings and we'll probably advertise that on Facebook and through our, our uh, newsletter. Um, something else just of note, uh, Outdoor Idaho, any Outdoor Idaho fans out there did a, a, a show called Trailblazers, which aired on May 14th through the Idaho Public Television Network. You can still watch that online at this link here. And they highlighted a couple of really great uh, groups, including the Idaho Trails Association. They're out helping take care of uh, trails in Idaho. Really interesting show if you want to have a glimpse into what we and other organizations and different groups like trail runners are out doing to help to caretake our trails in Idaho. Um, a new feature on the Idaho Trails Association website, we have uh, put up a trail reporter form. So just a reminder that when you're out doing your hikes this season, we really encourage you to come back to our website and fill out one of the trail reports. This just gives us information about what's on the trail. And as you can see on the form here, we're asking for things about like how many fallen trees you saw, if you saw any like rock fall or things that are impeding um, good travel on the trail. Um, and then you can also submit some pictures or even if you like to take waypoints of like down trees, all very helpful. And we will be sure to, um, make sure that information is uh, kind of rolls up to the Forest Service. And um, it's good information for us to know. And then also there is a, um, a public facing companion map that any of you can go to and actually see these trail reports. So you can see, you can get all of the information that people are submitting. Um, someone just asked what my name is. My name is Pam Bond. I am a part of the Idaho Trails Association. I am a board member, officially their secretary, and usually I'm hosting these um, trail, trail master presentations. Thanks for asking. So um, just to give you a little bit of background about why organizations like the Idaho Trails Association exist, um, for some time now, uh, the the amount of funds and personnel that have been allocated to caretaking public non-motorized trails in Idaho and many other Western states has declined. And so we know that those resources are starting to get choked in from um, trails being overgrown or having a lot of down trees that make them nearly impassable and are being maintained. And it's, it's becoming harder and harder to get to some of those trails with lack of resources. And so there are groups like the Idaho Trails Association Usually, I would start off our presentations with a little video, but those do not come over very well. 
in something like a Zoom. So I will use this as an opportunity to tell you about our YouTube channel. Um, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will always know when new presentations have been um, uploaded and um, all of our, a lot of our past presentations and some of our intro videos and promotional videos are up there. So feel free to check that out. We're also on all of the other social medias like Facebook and Instagram. So you can find us out there in all of those worlds. So just to, just to tell you a little bit more about um, the Idaho Trails Association, we were founded in 2010. So this is our 10 year anniversary, a big milestone for us. We would really, really love to be able to do some sort of big anniversary blowout party. But unfortunately with um, the way things are with the COVID pandemic, <laughs> we don't feel that that would be very responsible. So we're doing what we can to stay engaged with um, new folks and old members through things like our online webinars throughout the summer season. And we are still doing our, our trail maintenance projects, which is such a blessing. Um, so the whole idea of the Idaho Trails Association is to promote the continued enjoyment of Idaho's trek hiking trails. And we do that through, obviously through stewardship, by caretaking um, non-motorized trails through trail maintenance. We love to foster traditional trail maintenance skills um, using traditional tools like crosscut saws, as you can see here in this picture. Educating and, you know, kind of inspiring people to be more thoughtful about how they use the lands and care for the lands and knowing about what resources are available to them in Idaho. And then just being a part of that preservation system, preserving and protecting and making sure there is access to our non-motorized trails. And as you can see, over the last 10 years, we have really, really grown. I mean, I think the Idaho Trails Association started with one project. And now I think this year we have over probably somewhere between 30 and 40 projects going this year. We are a staff of three people, just very recently three people. We have an executive director, Jeff Halligan, who has done amazing, amazing things for our organization. Clay Jacobson, our trails uh, specialist who um, helps line up all the projects, get people out on the ground. And our newest member, Kelly Hughes, is our um, outreach and communication specialist who is helping make sure we have these events and are staying communicating with our volunteers and possible new members. So how can you help? Um, firstly, become a member of the Idaho Trails Association. And this really means, you know, a small financial contribution or a very large one if you feel like it. Um, and this will basically get you, you know, kind of signed up into our network. You'll be the first to know about what's going on, what projects are going on. Um, obviously, signing up for a trail project would be really, really awesome. We usually have a lot of different options. Um, we like to do some family friendly events. Those are usually like single day outings where it's really easy to bring out the kids and have everybody get involved. And then everything from single day to week long vacation type projects. Um, we call them vacations because this means that there's usually stock involved who are bringing in a lot of the gear that you need. And there may even be a camp cook who is making all of your meals. So you come out and you volunteer with us during the day and you walk back to camp to have a, a home cooked meal. Um, and then also in the last couple of years, we've started the Women Only Weekends program. Um, these projects are meant to get, you know, all female identifying persons out on the trail in a very, um, you know, kind of easy stepping stone project to get their feet wet and see if they even like trail projects before they head out with some of our co-ed groups really um, empowering program. And then also our youth week longs where we're taking out high school age kids from um, local schools in Idaho. And also um, really a great time to get our youth kind of embedded into nature. And then also we have monitoring projects where um, Clay will take out a handful of people into places like the Gospel Home Wilderness or the Seven Devils um, Hell's Canyon Wilderness areas and do like monitoring of trail conditions and um, where people are camping, like different kind of use sites. And really it's a big backpacking trip where you're stopping collecting some data along the way. There's usually about five to seven days long. And then also just be an advocate for your public land, stay informed about what's going on and um, you know, communicate your thoughts and feelings about, about caretaking for our public lands. So um, this year we have projects through a large part of the state, everything from the Panhandle National Forest we have done things in the Owyhee country, the Selkirks, White Cloud, Satus, Gospel Humps, all the big wilderness areas, Wood River Valley, you name it. We probably have something 
of interest for you to be a part of. So I definitely recommend going out to our website and checking out what projects are still available. And right now, I know we definitely still need projects for these um, people for these two projects, especially Cat and Lakes. This is going to be, I think, a five-day project. End of July, first part of August, four spots left. This is on the Boise National Forest, so just a few hour drive from the Treasure Valley area. And then if you want to go a little further afield, looking for about 12 people still to go out on the Snow Peak Lookout trip at the beginning of August on the St. Joe District up in kind of north central Idaho. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And first up, we are going to have Paul Holly from Idaho Mountain Rescue talking to us about um, some backcountry safety. So Paul, I'm going to stop my screen and let you begin. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining the webinar. Um, my name is Paul Holly. I'm the, uh, I'm the owner and uh, instructor at Idaho uh, Rescue Training, and I'm also a senior instructor with Knowles Wilderness Medicine. Um, Idaho Rescue Training basically exists to host uh, Knowles Wilderness uh, wilderness medicine courses, wilderness first aid, wilderness first responder courses. Um, we're the largest provider in the state of Idaho. We also are operating in Utah and uh, starting in February in Nepal. So I'm excited to have a, our first woofer in Nepal there. Um, I've uh, also uh, actually spent a summer as a trail crew leader uh, working for Northwest Youth Corps. Um, and then uh, I'm also the head brewer and owner at Sawtooth Brewery, hence all the beer cans behind me. Um, I've been just wrapping up a, a shift here at the brewery trying to install a candy palletizer. So uh, we got part of it installed. Uh, we're getting there. Um, yeah, and then Sawtooth Brewery also because I enjoy uh, digging trail uh, also cleans the Hell Roaring Trail uh, most years. We're taking this year off, but uh, we clean the Hell, uh, Hell Roaring Trail up in the Sawtooth seat here. Um, so part of uh, what we're looking at with uh, first aid in the backcountry or wilderness first aid, remote first aid, however you want to call it, is just deciding when, when you need help. Um, and one of the big things that we advocate for is don't get in trouble in the first place. Right? Let's start with a little bit of prevention, uh, a little bit uh, in some uh, just going slow when you need to, being realistic with uh, your abilities, your resources, um, and then balancing uh, just paying attention and balancing what the consequences are of what happens if something goes wrong, right? Is this going to be a, a, a no biggie or is this going to be a long day or a long week for a lot of people trying to get you out of the backcountry? So just uh, think about prevention. Uh, change your behavior when you're in the backcountry. Um, do things slightly different uh, than you do in the front country. I'll always remember leading a group of high school uh, trail crew members and the first day this kid was saying, hey, I can do a backflip off this street. I said, no, please don't, right? It's two hours to get to the hospital and that's on a good day. So maybe do that in the front country, not out here. And just changing how we're doing, changing some of those things. And that was a big realization for him that prevention makes a big difference. If something does happen, don't make it worse, right? That's one of the big things, uh, especially in search and rest. We're like, hey, just stop, take care of it. Check things out, do a good assessment, gather information. Don't do things quickly. Don't make things worse, right? And then you're gonna decide, what do we do with this patient, right? What do we do uh, to take care of um, uh, what's going on? We might be able to stay in play. We might be able to stay in the back country, manage uh, what's happened, uh, take care of any injuries that's, uh, that have happened, modify what we're doing, uh, monitor the injury or the illness, and then continue through on through the backcountry. We might need to do what we call uh, at Knowles Wilderness Medicine an evacuation. And that's simply leaving the backcountry because something has happened medically or uh, traumatically. Uh, maybe that's just a sunburn and it sounds a lot better to take care of a sunburn on the couch watching Netflix than it does carrying a backpack on your back. So uh, you might evacuate. For these we think like, hey, I just need to go home or maybe I just need to go to the doctor but I don't need to go to the ER. Um, and that's just a simple evacuation. Go home, go to your doctor. Your goal is to get there in a reasonable amount of time um, and take care of what's happening. 
We also then have what we call a rapid evacuation. And with rapid evacuation, with these we're thinking we have a life-threatening emergency or we have a limb-threatening emergency. And anytime we have a life or limb-threatening emergency, we, uh, our goal is to get to the ER as fast as possible. That could be an hour, that could be a day, that could be a week, right? Uh, but our goal is to use all available resources to get to the hospital. Um, that's the, this is the equivalent of calling 911. And maybe that's how you achieve uh, the evacuation in the backcountry and you access all of those external resources. And instead of being isolated by yourself, get the whole world on your side and the whole world attempting to get you out of the backcountry. Uh, that's how uh, calling 911 activates search and rescue. You can activate uh, getting some sort of helicopter into you. All of that starts by accessing some sort of 911 system. So uh, your goal should be to have some sort of communication or some sort of method of communicating to the outside world that you need help. That could be spot device, that could be a satellite phone, satellite text messaging. Um, it could just be your absence, right? You could say, hey, I'm gonna be back by Tuesday at five o'clock and if I'm not here, call 911, right? Something's happened um, and somebody knows that we're looking for you. And there's several uh, high profile cases of, hey, just, you know, we would have come and got you, but we didn't know you need help and, or we didn't know where you were. So uh, plan ahead on, on your communication to the outside world and then just think through, do I need a doctor? Do I need to go home? Or do I need to get to the ER? Uh, and is, is this a life or limb threatening emergency? With COVID, think about uh, if you are on some sort of outing or some sort of uh, group trip, uh, read the CDC uh, signs and symptoms for uh, COVID before you head out. Make some sort of decision. Hey, if somebody comes down with this, how are we going to isolate the rest of the group from them? How are we going to work to get this person out? And we don't need to ex uh, evacuate everybody that has a little sniffle, sniffles or a low-grade fever. We're looking for uh, some distinct signs and symptoms that, that say, hey, this isn't allergies or this isn't, you know, some... Uh, a bad cook that didn't wash their hands well enough, this is something much more serious. One of the most common things that we see in the backcountry uh, that we need to take care of is wounds. And uh, really there's, uh, there's three big things that we're looking at for wounds. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of myths around how to clean wounds and how to take care of wounds. Uh, most likely your mom was wrong, your dad was wrong, and uh, most things that you've heard are wrong unless you're cleaning it with water and keeping it moist afterwards. So um, our three goals are that we need to stop the bleed, uh, we want to prevent infection, and then we want to work at promoting healing. Uh, with stopping the bleeding, uh, most of this is going to come from direct pressure, right? Direct pressure and elevation. Uh, if it's a big bleed, don't be scared to get in there and, and take the pads of your fingers and really dig into the wound very aggressively and very uncomfortably. The harder you push, the better it is, uh, you're, the better you're going to be at stopping the bleed. Uh, if that doesn't work, consider wrapping an ACE bandage around it pretty tight. Uh, that's called a pressure dressing. Um, and that'll, we're not, our goal isn't a tourniquet, but our goal is to just, uh, in a more broad area, slow the bleeding down. Um, and then uh, if that doesn't work, put a commercial grade tourniquet on. Um, and uh, improvised tourniquets can work. They're really hard. Make sure you have the wind list, right? some sort of stick in there that you're turning. Uh, a belt is actually more dangerous for the limb than a tourniquet. Um, so don't just put a belt on there and try and pull it tight. Um, have some sort of commercial tourniquet in there. Uh, and we advocate for folks to carry a tourniquet uh, when they have a higher instance or a higher risk of needing one. Uh, trail work would definitely be a time where I would wanna have a tourniquet with me but I'm thinking about things like hunters, uh, motorized vehicles, uh, basically anytime you add a motor, whether that's a, a, an ATV, uh, a dirt bike, a chainsaw, um, any of those times where we add a motor, we're adding enough energy that we have an increased risk of needing a tourniquet. Uh, compared to just backpacking, you have a very low risk of needing a tourniquet just because you don't have enough energy to cut yourself that bad. Uh, at Knowles, we have actually never applied a tourniquet in the field just because we believe in human-powered recreation ever compared, to, uh, compared to motorized recreation. We don't send our kids out into the woods with chainsaws. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, commercial tourniquets are, are fairly inexpensive. Um, 
uh, and fairly easy to access. Then just watch a couple of YouTube videos about how to turn it on and just turn it till it stops the bleeding. Once we've managed bleeding or if it wasn't bleeding that bad to start with, we need to start thinking about how are we going to prevent infection. Um, and with preventing infection, our goal is to remove the infectious material or the infectious uh, um, substances from the wound instead of trying to kill them and leave them in there. We've been talking a lot about how to, about washing hands and hand sanitizer and all that. And I like to think a uh, very similar way about wounds as I do washing hands versus hand sanitizer, right? We wash our hands after we go to the bathroom because we've essentially touched poop, right? It's a bathroom, there's poop everywhere. So we wash our hands, we remove that poop from our hands. If we just use hand sanitizer, all we're doing is killing the poop and it's still on our hands. So uh, the same thing goes for wounds. Let's get the infectious material out compared to trying to kill it with some sort of uh, uh, chemical. And there's a lot of research uh, that shows that uh, pressure irrigation with water is more effective than chemical treatments. So the only things that we're only thing that we're going to put into a wound is water that's clean enough to drink. However, you made it clean enough to drink, go for it. Um, we can use hand soap on large abrasions, um, uh, especially abras abrasions that are uh, have dirt embedded in them, uh, and that's it right? Water and hand soap. That's how we want to clean wounds. No hydrogen peroxide, no rubbing alcohol. Um, those will actually delay healing and uh, will leave infectious material in the, in the wound. So uh, a pressure irrigation syringe, like the little irrigation syringe when you, you had when you blasted, uh, blasted out your dry sockets after you had your wisdom teeth removed, that is great at just blasting out wounds. And we're looking to put a couple of liter, liters of water through that irrigation syringe through that wound. Once we've cleaned that wound effectively, uh, and that can take 15, 20 minutes, an hour, right? Uh, you can also think about taking all of the little chunks out with tweezers. Uh, it's not going to be an enjoyable process, but neither is an infection. Once we've cleaned that wound, then our goal is to prevent infection, uh, or sorry, to promote healing. Um, and the way we're going to promote healing is we're going to keep the wounds moist and we're going to keep them protected. Uh, the moisture comes from some sort of triple antibiotic ointment, double antibiotic ointment, uh, even just something as simple as Vaseline um, or uh, second skin, which is a water-based uh, gauze, basically. That'll keep that, the skin moist. It'll heal faster. And then let's keep it protected to keep that moisture in there and to keep the dirt out. Double and triple antibiotic ointment is about keeping infection out, not killing infection that's left in the skin. You've already removed the infection. Now we need to keep the wound moist so that it can heal. And it, that's one of the big things where everyone's wrong, right? The uh, old idea of like, you gotta give it a little UV, you gotta let it dry out so that it can heal is completely false. There's no research that backs that up. Um, and anecdotally, I've had many wounds where it was like, as soon as I put some triple antibiotic ointment for, on it for a little while, it healed right up, right? It healed in two or three days after even a week or two of not healing. So keep that, uh, keep that wound moist. And then when we're thinking about uh, evacuation for wounds, um, just think realistically, is this something that you can manage in the field, right? If, uh, if you just look at it and the mechanism of injury involved something just really disgusting, let's go ahead and evacuate even before infection sets in. Or if you start to see signs of infection that you're unable to control, let's go ahead and, and go to the doctor, get those antibiotics, get it cleaned out even better in a clinical setting where they'll take the green scrubby type thing from your kitchen and just scrub inside your wound until all the dirt comes out. Um, uh, animal bites, uh, we want to evac, all animal bites. Um, things to the face, things to the hands uh, and joints where having excess scar tissue can have a negative impact on our quality of life. Let's go ahead and evac and get it looked at. There's no hard rule for when you need stitches, but if you're thinking about uh, being able to stick whole fingers inside of there, there's a good chance you're going to need some stitches or some sort of more aggressive closure. Uh, and then another, uh, a common question that we get asked a lot is, hey, what's the best first aid kit? And uh, basically it's the one that you have, right? Especially the one that you have that's been resupplied after your last trip. So uh, make sure you have a first aid kit. 
um, customize it for your trip, customize it on how you're going to carry it, um, how many people you have, any known medical conditions, what your activity is, um, what are the specific risks that you have. A winter first aid kit for backcountry skiing is going to look very different than one that you have for rock climbing or mountain biking. Uh, and that'll look very different than the one that I carry on my raft, right? It's my raft. I can carry a pallet of beer down the river, down the Salmon River. Why would I not have a tourniquet, blood pressure cuff, and stethoscope? Let's take some extra stuff because we've brought a cot, a kitchen sink, and a table with us. Let's maybe bump up how much is going into our first aid kit because we have that luxury. Uh, it's nice to start with a commercially built first aid kit um, just because it's a whole lot easier. You get a cool package with the first aid logos on it. Um, Knowles sells them on their website. Uh, good value. Uh, you all, it's also cheaper uh, for them to buy 10,000 band-aids at a time and then stock them into a first aid kit uh, compared to buying 12 band-aids at a time. Carry stuff you know how to use. Uh, carry stuff that is realistic for using. Right? I'm never going to carry a, uh, a needle decompression kit because I have a low likelihood of needing it and I have no idea how to use it. So I'm not going to carry one with me even though it sounds super cool and I watched a YouTube video. That's just not uh, something that, we're, uh, that really would make it into my first aid kit. Uh, and then take a class, right? Think of, uh, think of knowledge as another resource that you can gain, whether that's the three-hour American Heart Association or Red Cross class, um, go ahead and uh, take one of those. There's lots of great information. Uh, Idaho Rescue Training offers a two-day wilderness first aid class. Uh, it's 16 hours. We have uh, two coming up in Haley, uh, one in Boise in August, another one in Boise in October. Um, uh, we also have a 10-day variety, a wilderness first responder that's geared towards being farther out or uh, geared towards folks that uh, will have other people that they're responsible to for, basically. And our, our target audience there is things like river guides, climbing guides, uh, outdoor professionals um, that uh, have a higher chance of seeing something just because they're out so often, uh, but are also responsible for other folks. Compared to the Wilderness First Aid, where it's a great two days of, of learning a lot of things to do, uh, especially when you're taking care of your family, or just being a little bit more prepared um, for your own uh, adventures into the backcountry. Uh, you can find all of that information on um, uh, uh, the Idaho Rescue Training website. I'm going to go ahead and share uh, a little screen here. So let's see. I think you can see this. So this is uh, the Idaho Rescue Training website, idrescuetraining.com. Uh, on the Knowles Wilderness Medicine page, uh, you can see. Oops. Yep, I think it's coming up. Uh, you'll be able to see all of the different wilderness medicine classes that we offer, uh, from wilderness first aid classes, uh, wilderness first responder courses, um, uh, our recertification, and then we also cater to uh, medical professionals such as EMTs, nurses, and doctors. So uh, those are some of the, uh, the offerings that are out there if you'd like to just gain more information and be a little bit more prepared for uh, what's happening uh, or what might happen in the backcountry. So, um, does anyone have any questions? I'll see if I can exit out of this and go to chat. Yeah, if anyone has questions, please feel free to um, put them in the chat there. And um, I have, I took Paul's two-day wilderness first aid course. Yeah. It was really great. Um, I don't, I don't care who you are. If you spend any amount of time in the backcountry, even if you're just like a front country hiker, or walker or whatever like super great information so highly recommended i'm already signed up for yeah. to research in october yeah. excellent we'll see you there yeah uh and um yeah most things that we teach also apply to the fun country so uh, it's definitely not you know uh, a skill that only applies uh when you're away from help absolutely okay well i haven't seen any questions coming yet but if anyone thinks of anything oh wait here we go uh, uh, Debbie says, okay, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Uh, uh, teaching over in the Victor and Driggs area, uh, Idaho Rescue Training does not teach over there. Uh, the Knowles has its own base over there, um, and so we have uh, the Knowles base offers courses as well as we have an instructor uh, named Iris that lives there that offers courses. So we do have quite a few over there, um, 
And we do have, uh, we do offer quite a bit in Jackson. Uh, if you go to knowles.edu, you'll be able to see the full list of classes that are offered across the country. We've taught in uh, all 50 states, and I want to say it's like 13 countries. Um, so it's pretty, uh, we're very widespread um, uh, availability. And we're building back up. We're offering a little bit more this fall um, uh, since we shut down uh, for about three months. Uh, and then do we offer an online format. We uh, not for the wilderness first aid. Uh, Idaho Rescue Training will test individuals out for uh, the American Heart Association online uh, first aid class. Uh, we looked at it, but the way that our form uh, our format works, uh, it's too social and too hands on to be able to transition it to an online uh, format. Uh, and then most common injury uh, the. Most common injuries that we see are injuries to the um, uh, usable ankle injuries, uh, usable knee injuries, uh, burns in the kitchen, um, and then when we uh, and then wounds. Uh, and the most fatal injury uh, that we see are um, uh, falls in the backcountry, uh, fall from heights, rock climbing, skiing, uh, that across knolls and then across. Um, the park service is the most fatal type of injury uh, is falls. And then uh, what do we show it to, uh, in terms of uh, breaks, uh, fractures, uh, we show you how to assess basically is an injury usable or not uh, since we are unable to take a backcountry x-ray, um, but we do teach how to splint injuries. Um, and then our, uh, our advice for uh, head injuries or concussions in the backcountry is all head injuries should go to the hospital. Um, uh, and then if you have a serious head injury where they have a prolonged change in level of responsiveness or level of consciousness, uh, it's a rapid evacuation and you're most likely gonna need additional resources to get them out. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Well, hopefully we'll get some more people signed up for um, yeah. some of those classes. That's awesome. All right, so up next, we're going to have Whitney Allgood LaRufa. He's a seasoned long-distance hiker and has been quite involved in the long-distance hiking community. And I'll let you do a little bit more of an intro of yourself because I feel like you have a long list of credentials. And he's going to be talking, talking to us about um, safe stream crossing. So I'll let you go ahead and share your screen and take over. All right, well, uh, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, yeah, as Pam said, I'm a very experienced long-distance hiker. I started long distance hiking in 1996 on the Appalachian Trail. I moved out west in 2000. I've been a backcountry ranger before on different trails in the US. And um, I've hiked all throughout the Western United States, the Continental Divide Trail, Sierra High Route, uh, Oregon Desert Trail. So I'm a pretty long hiking resume. I'm also the President Emeritus of the American Long Distance Hiking Association West, which is a West Coast organization uh, that promotes fellowship and information amongst long distance hikers. So I led that organization for six years. And I'm now currently the vice president of sales and marketing and some product design at Six Moon Designs, which is an ultralight backpacking company based here in Portland, Oregon. So I'm going to talk with you all today about how to cross stream safely. And I'm going to share my screen here because I got a little uh, PowerPoint for you all. Let's so do this. Can you all see that? I'm sorry, I can't. Ooh. Yep, we can see. I think you're good. Okay. All right. Well, so today we're going to talk about crossing streams safely, and then I'll answer questions at the end. Um, but one of the biggest safety factors and biggest risks that I think a lot of people experience in their long distance hiking, or even just out for a weekend, especially in the mountains of Idaho or Oregon or the Pacific Northwest, is stream crossings. Um, I think that they pose a greater risk than people realize sometimes. Um, so why do they cause a great risk? Well, a lot of times when we're out early in the season, streams can be very swollen from snow melt or from the unexpected rain, maybe even a rain in a mountain range, you know, one over or a area where it's not raining on us, but it has been swallowing the rivers from other areas. So as you approach a river, there's a lot of unseen dangers or in a stream. There could be submerged logs that you get caught on or slip on while you're trying to cross. 
Uh, there could be rocks or holes that have formed behind rocks that you could get a foot jam in and get caught in while you're trying to cross a stream or a river. And then you also have shifting creek beds. Um, a lot of times if you're in a glacial area where you're getting a glacial stream that you have to cross, that river bed can shift and change due to sand and small rocks rolling down from the glacier runoff that can create a lot of, pose a lot of risk of a bump on the ankle or just losing your footing. So the main three dangers you're gonna face when going into a stream are number one, drowning. I mean, that's really the number one risk we wanna avoid while you're out there is drowning in a river because you slip and fall and can't get back up. Your gear is pushing you down. The second thing you risk is getting swept downstream. I actually have a hiking partner whose trail name is Swept Away because when she was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, it was an early season southbound hike through the North Cascades and she went into a river lost her footing and got swept a couple hundred yards downstream before she was able to grab something to pull herself out with. The third danger you have is losing your gear. And I think that's a big factor a lot of people worry about in river crossings where they don't unbuckle their gear or do it safely is they're worried if they fall in the river and their gear gets swept away, now they're out in the backcountry with no gear. Um, but my only thing about that is I would say it's much better to lose your gear than to lose your life. All right, next we're gonna talk about choosing where to cross. So a lot of times, you know, if you're using a GPS unit or an app or even a map, you'll be hiking down the trail and you'll come to an area where you have to cross a stream. But depending on conditions, it might not be the best place to actually cross that stream. A lot of trails are built with more of the summer hiking season in mind or during the summer season where maybe that river isn't quite as high. So the picture on this slide is actually a bridge that's submerged in water on the Colorado Trail in uh, Colorado in the spring. So there's usually a big footbridge there, but it's actually making a rapid, that's how high the river is. So just because you're coming to where the trail is might not be the best place to cross. So if you get to an area where you don't feel it's safe to cross, generally I'll start scouting upstream and downstream looking for a better place to cross. If there's a natural bridge to cross, such as a log or maybe some rocks, I mean, that's always a plus, um, besides just trying to keep your feet dry for the pleasant factor of it during the day. It also just create a way to stay out of the water and have to deal with the hydraulics and the currents pushing against you. If I can't find something to naturally cross on, I'll look for riffles or shallow areas. So generally, where a river starts getting wider and braiding out and has more lighter riffles on top, it means it's going to be shallower there and the current might not be as strong. So if possible, find a place like that to be able to cross the river safely. If I'm coming to an area and I'm not sure how deep the water is, I'm only 5'8", so I've oftentimes uh, gone into river crossings and been quickly up to my waist or even my chest without realizing it. I try to test the depth before I can with either a stick or my trekking pole to kind of probe ahead and see how deep the water is I'm going into. And then if you are dealing with glacial runoff or conditions where snow melt is a major factor, there are times when you might come to a river crossing where it's just not gonna be safe to cross until the next morning. So with the refreezing, the freeze thaw that goes on during the spring, if you can hole up during the late afternoon at that river crossing and wait till the early morning, river levels can drop dramatically making what wouldn't be a safe spot to cross much safer in the morning. So I'm gonna talk about three different ways to cross the river based on if you're by yourself, with a hiking partner or in a group. Um, so solo river crossings do require that you have a fair amount of leg strength, but it also requires you having a fair amount of confidence in yourself, in your balance, and your strength to get across that water. And I would suggest before hiking season, if you have an opportunity, maybe go out with a friend who fishes, um, maybe do some wading in a river with a pair of waders on where you'll be more dry and comfortable, and just get confident with the feel of water on your body and moving through the current that you might deal with later in the year. So when you do enter the water, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is face upstream. It's very important to face upstream to make sure you're aware of any objects that could be coming down the stream or river, such as a swept away log or you know, boaters or anything else you might encounter kind of dangerous coming downstream on you. So you wanna face upstream. Not only that, it's also gonna give you more strength as you kind of side shuffle your way across than just trying to walk straight across the current. 
It's really important to leave your boots on or your shoes on for traction. A lot of times I see people kind of afraid to get their shoes wet and their socks wet because they don't want to be uncomfortable the rest of the day. Um, but if you wear trail runners to hike in instead of traditional heavy duty boots, they will dry out quite quickly after you get out of the water. Um, but having that extra level of traction in your footwear can make a big difference in crossing slick rocks or other dangerous terrain in a riverbed. You generally want to unbuckle your hip belt and your sternum strap for safety. Um, the reason for this, if you did get knocked down or fall over, you would easily be able to slip out of your backpack. Um, there has been quite a few incidents over the years, especially in Oregon, where people have tried to cross a river, fall in, and been pinned down in the river bottom by their backpack and drowned because of their backpack. I also really suggest using trekking poles. If you don't have trekking poles, try to find two really sturdy sticks that you can use for extra stability. And kind of the rule of thumb is to try to keep three points of contact as you're moving. So two poles connected to the river bottom as you move one foot um, makes you a lot more stable, like a tripod as you're moving through the water. If you're lucky enough to have a hiking partner or two hiking partners, there's a couple different methods to cross in pairs. So the first way is the side-by-side -side method. For that method, you would lock arms and each of you have a pole in the outer hand that you each have. And you would cross the river facing upstream, just like you would do in a solo situation, but you have the extra stability of another person in case one of you slips to kind of grab each other. The better method with two people though, is the front and back method. And for this method, what you're gonna to wanna to do is put the stronger person or the bigger person in the front. They're gonna actually kind of act like a rock and create an eddy behind themselves for the second person to have a little bit less current to deal with, but also more stability. When you're doing this, you're gonna to wanna to have that second person behind you either put their arms up underneath your armpits or maybe around your waist, and you're gonna to walk together very slowly, kind of side shuffle your way through the, the water until you get to the other side. Now, if you're in a large group and dealing with a large river or deep water crossing, another way to do this is to form a human chain. Um, the human chain is a pretty good method, especially with a larger group, because you're allowing the stability of everyone to work together. So when you do this, you're gonna wanna put the stronger person in the water first, and then kind of the weaker hikers towards the end as you're entering into the water, because eventually you're gonna get to a point where you're gonna have to start leapfrogging people along. And when you do the leapfrogging, there's different ways to do it, but generally what I do for the leapfrogging in a group situation is as the last person in the chain walk behind the people that are creating a break in the current so they have softer water conditions and can hold on to them for stability as they work their way along the human chain to the other side of the river. And you just continue to leapfrog the group and adding on in the chain until you're on the other side. All right, so lastly, a few more tips. Um, one is don't be afraid to turn around if a river or stream is too dangerous to cross. Um, I've been on trips where glacial runoff was just too high in the summer and you're eight miles into a two day trip and you just have to bail because there's no safe way around the river. And there's no shame in doing that. Um, never go upstream on strainers or logs. Also, if you ever are on a log crossing a river, don't drop off on the upstream side. If you need to go into the water, you're losing your footing or something, fall on the downstream side of that log so you're not caught in the strainer and trapped because that could really be dangerous. Um, these are micro spikes. I'm sure a lot of you use these for snow in the early season. If you have those with you and you're gonna cross a wet log, I suggest putting them on. It creates a lot of extra stability and traction. It works like a pair of corker boots. Uh, to give you more stability as you're going across wet, slippery rog logs. Uh, you're also going to want to bag all your electronics. Uh, myself, I use my cell phone as my GPS unit when I'm hiking. So uh, there's some great bags out there. This company, Locksack, makes these waterproof electronic bags. I put all my electronics into waterproof bags before I'm going to cross a stream or a river, and I store them up high in my backpack, uh, ensuring that they stay dry as possible so I don't short out any of my electronics when I'm out in the woods. And then I'd say the final tip is just remember that it is much better to lose your gear than it is to lose your life. And um, gear can always be replaced, but you can't. So if you lose your gear, you're probably gonna have a pretty adventuresome story to share with people afterwards, but at least you'll still be here to tell the story.
All right. Let me see. Stop sharing. Okay. So I can answer any questions if anybody has some. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Whitney. I see there's one question here. Can you see that? Yep, I see two questions. So uh, any tips for crossing a river with your dog? Good question. I actually hike a lot with the Black Lab. Um, we use a roughware pack that has a handle on the top. So when I do a river crossing with him, I'll generally take his pack off of the harness and put it on top of my own pack. And then I'll put him on the downstream side of myself. I'll use one trekking pole and I'll hold on to the top handle of his harness as we're crossing. That way we can get across safely. Um, but he has surprised me over the years too. I've seen a lot of dogs just pop up on a wet log and cross the river without thinking twice about it. So, um, there, and then question through Facebook, I'm planning on wearing chakras. Okay. So the question is I'm planning on wearing chakras for crossing any stream versus my boots. What do you think? The chaco is a pretty solid choice of footwear for crossing a river. It's what a lot of rafting guides use, um, for rafting. They do have good traction. I personally usually don't carry an extra pair of sandals because I try to keep my pack as light as possible. Um, the only concern I would have with wearing a pair of Chacos is uh, you could potentially stub your toe in a rock or something, which could, you know, cause a little bit of pain. But otherwise, that'd be a pretty solid choice of footwear. All right, any other questions? All right, I guess we're good. Awesome. Thanks, Whitney. Yeah, when we'll, we'll circle right around at the end for um, questions for anybody. So um, if you have others for you out there, you know, please, please catch up with us at the end. All right. So next we have Evan O'Neill from the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. He's a regional conservation edu educator, and he's going to be talking to us about being bear aware. Hi, Evan. You want to go ahead and share your screen? You bet, Pam. Well. Thank you. Is that coming up? Everybody see a purple screen? I can see a purple screen. Splendid. Looks like it's working then. Well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I work for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, have been working for them for, gosh, a long time now, 25 years, but in a previous life, I spent um, six years working in Wyoming, and uh, several of those years I spent working on the uh, interagency grizzly bear team, and so I got to spend a fair amount of time in the backcountry working with bears. So I know a little bit about uh, a little bit about bears and uh, what makes them tick, and I hope that uh, I can share some things with you tonight that you'll find uh, that you'll find informative. So uh, I wanted to start tonight just talking about things that you uh, should look for when you're in the backcountry uh, hiking. Um, one of the most intuitive ones, but one that people often violate, is to avoid closed areas. Um, sometimes we'll be we'll be doing some trapping, or there'll be an area where we've got a bear in the area, and we want to keep that area closed for the bear's safety as well as uh, human safety. And uh, folks disregard that. So um, yeah, avoid closed areas whenever you're out in the woods and uh, just pay attention to the signs that might be there. Hiking in parties of two or more is always a great idea. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. You wanna carry bear spray and know how to use it. You wanna make noise while you're hiking. This alerts bears to your presence. You wanna be extra careful around moving water. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Look for bear sign along the trail. These are all things that you can see along the trail that uh, are signs that a bear has been in the area. So if you're watching for this sort of thing, um, it will help you to be a little more aware that maybe you've got a bear around. So first of all, closed areas. Uh, if the sign says the area is closed, you should stay out of it. Um, find a different area to hike, uh, find a way around, uh, whatever it might be, but don't go to, into an area that has been posted as closed. That's for your safety and, like I said, also for the bears. Uh, hiking in parties of two or more is always a good idea um, for a lot of reasons. You keep each other company. You can visit while you're hiking. 
And uh, you can also have a person there in case you get into some kind of a, a situation. But uh, just having a, that extra person along tends to um, uh, incentivize people to talk a little bit more and make noise as a result, and therefore alert bears to your presence. So I mentioned carry bear spray and know how to use it. Um, there's several different varieties out there on the market. Um, I don't know that I necessarily endorse any of them over, over another, but uh, I typically use counter assault when I'm out in the field. Um, what you see here is a, a can of counter assault and then a second can with a holster. And then finally the inert training canisters, the one on the, uh, on the right. So there's lots of brands available, but uh, you want to have your, if you're going to pack bear spray, you want to have it available. Uh, I've seen people take their bear spray and then they put it in a backpack when they go into the field. And uh, that's not the place for it. Uh, if you need to use your bear spray, you're going to have seconds to deploy it. And rummaging around in a pack is not the time to be, uh, when a bear is charging it, that's not the time to be rummaging around in your pack trying to find your bear spray. Um, and the inert cans you can purchase if you'd like, uh, they're, they're practice cans, so they just have the propellant in them. They don't have any of the active ingredients that it's found in counter assault, but buying one of those cans and just seeing how it works is not a bad idea. You want to leave your handgun at home. I always talk to people who say, you know, when I go to the backcountry and I'm worried about bears, I take my gun along. And a handgun is just not a good choice when you're backpacking. Um, and there's lots of reasons for it. It breeds overconfidence. Folks figure if they've got a gun on them, they're okay. And so they're a little less cautious than they might be otherwise. Uh, they're impractical. Most people cannot make the kind of shot, a kill shot that they'd need to make from a handgun to drop a charging bear. They have a very narrow window of uh, target area on a charging bear. And you have, as I mentioned, only seconds to acquire your target and get that shot off. So uh, that's one point of being impractical. A second is um, you might miss the bear and hit your companion. Um, and you don't want to live with that if something like that were to happen. We've had situations where um, two or three people have been charged by a bear. They all got off rounds at the bear and we tracked that bear and found it and it had no bullet holes in it, no wounds at all. And these are, these are folks firing at point blank range, but you're just so amped up, you can't make the kind of shot you need to make. Um, and we had a situation just a few years ago where a bear charged and attacked uh, one member of a hunting group, a second member of that group uh, drew a bead on, that, on the, uh, the bear and fired, killed the bear, but the bullet passed through the bear and killed his hunting companion. So that's just not something that any of us would want to live with. Uh, so for that reason, you want to, for all these reasons, you want to leave your guns at home. It's a fact that bear spray saves lives. Uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, you don't have to be any kind of an expert to use bear spray. It's incredibly effective. Uh, it's been scientifically proven to be the most effective uh, of all the deterrents out there for bears. So it's the stuff to use. And one of the great things about it is it's non-fatal to non-targets. So if you spray to uh, uh, stop a charging bear and some of that spray happens to get on your partner, uh, they're not going to be very happy with you for a while, but uh, they're going to survive. And that's the good thing. Make noise while you travel. I see there's a note on here already about, do you recommend bear bells? Um, I only recommend bear bells if you want to be absolutely crazy after about day two. Uh, just the constant jingling of that, of that bell can drive a person to uh, insanity. So uh, I have a bell, I use it every now and then, and you know, they're, they're fine if, uh, if you want to uh, pack one along. But like I said, the, the psychological damage that the bell might cause you might, uh, might dissuade you from wanting to do that. Um, so I recommend taking somebody with you and spending your time talking with them. And if you got a walking stick with you, smack it against the tree every now and then. If you're walking by yourself, uh, talk to yourself. 
uh, or talk to the other animals out there. Uh, I walk along sometimes and say, hey bear, I'm here. Don't, uh, don't be surprised. So there's the Bear Bell uh, recommendation if you'd like to. Um, I mentioned that uh, you need to be particularly careful around moving water. Um, the, mo the, the water motion and the sound that it makes uh, will mask your sound as you approach a riparian area. And bears like to hang out in riparian areas, so it's kind of a recipe for disaster. So you wanna be extra, extra careful, extra on your guard when you're approaching a stream or a river, just because bears will not be able to hear as well uh, at your approach. And then you wanna look for obvious signs of bears. Uh, here's some black bear tracks in the mud. These are pretty fresh, so I knew right away I've got a bear right around here somewhere. So look for that kind of sign when you're out and about. Um, bears do leave a lot of other uh, sign that they've been in the area. Uh, this is a big pile of scat that a bear dropped on the trail. Um, scat is one of the uh, one of the most obvious choices for signs to look for for bears and you know you can get down and take a look at it a close look at it and tell whether it's fresh or it's days old whatever it might be um, it'll be obviously be moist if it's uh, if it's pretty fresh and so that tells you something that there's a bear maybe in the in the immediate area uh, this is a pretty common behavior amongst bears they will they will tear up logs to uh, to get ants or grubs out of the logs so if you find one of these ripped up and it's all fresh like this where the there's there's shiny new uh, bark and wood uh, fragments that tells you that the bear's been here real recently um, bears like to do this too they'll go into meadows and they'll either dig up voles or um, field mice but they also dig up tubers to eat so if you see an area that kind of looks like it's been rototilled out in the wilderness, that's, uh, that's a bear that's done that. This is another behavior you'll see bears do, particularly in uh, times when uh, there's a drought situation and food is hard to come by. Uh, bears will strip the bark off of trees and then they'll, they'll gnaw on that white cambium layer that you see there with their, with their teeth. They don't get a lot of nutrition out of it and it's probably a net loss of calories for them, but they will do that sometimes just to get something to eat. Um, so again, watch for that. And of course, berries, we like berries, bears like berries. So whether it's a, a stand of buffalo berry like this or huckleberries or whatever kind of berry it might be, if you come across a pretty uh, robust crop of those, there's a good chance that there's going to be a bear around harvesting those as well. And then finally, kind of the obvious one is um, a carcass. Come upon a carcass, uh, if, particularly if it's really fresh, you need to be on the alert. Um, if you're hiking in open country and you, you see a carcass up ahead, you really should take the time to glass it to make sure that there's not a bear bedded there because bears will often do that. If they make a kill, they will, they will eat for a while and then they'll bed down right next to the carcass to guard it from other predators coming in and feeding on it. And while they're laying there sleeping, if you come along and you're not paying attention and you, uh, you surprise them, they jump up, you might have a situation on your hands because a, a food cache like this is a pretty valuable thing to a bear and so they will normally try and defend it. Um, let me catch up on a few of the questions that we've got here coming in. How accurate is the expiration date on bear spray? Um, I think it's fairly accurate, Jay. Um, my recommendation is that you weigh your canisters to see if they have uh, somehow leaked, because that's, that's a real bad feeling when you're out in the woods and you deploy your bear spray and nothing comes out the end of it. So um, yeah, if you weigh those things, that's really what you need to do. And uh, the canister should weigh exactly what it weighed when you bought it. Um, so that you know that that propellant and the uh, the active ingredients are still viable. We heard you should not yell or scream to frighten off a bear. True or not? We'll talk about that in just a second here, Vicki. Uh, hanging a bear bag no matter where you are in the backcountry. Um, it's a good idea to hang a bear bag. I think I think you're talking about camping, Catherine. Um, yeah, when I'm out when I'm out in bear country, uh, I put everything in a bag. Um, and that includes deodorant, um, toothpaste, uh, anything that might throw a scent that might attract a bear, that all goes in that bag and that bag gets hung at least 10 feet high and four feet from the tree trunk. 
Um, that can be kind of difficult to do in some cases. If you're up above tree line, see if you can find a cliff to take the bag and hook it on a rope and toss it over the cliff and let it hang suspended uh, for the night. I've never yet seen a bear smart enough to figure out how to pull the rope up and get the bag. So that's a good one for a situation where you're above tree line. Um, Barry says, do you recommend carrying bear spray in any areas around McCall or the sawtooths? It's always a good idea to have it with you. Um, you just, you never know. I mean, McCall and sawtooths, you're going to run into black bears there. And, um, it's just a good idea to have bear spray with you. I, I do a lot of rafting in the wilderness area and I always take bear spray with me just to have in camp in case we get a bear that comes in in the night. Um, so a good idea anytime you're in the back country. It's important to remember that all of Idaho is, uh, is bear country. So even clear down in the Owyhees, the Owyhee Desert, you'll run into black bears down there occasionally. So it's less likely certainly, and there's other areas of the state where you're more likely to run into a bear. Um, but having the bear spray along, it's just a, it's an easy, uh, it's an easy insurance policy. So I recommend folks take it whenever they go packing in, in, uh, in the forest. Uh, oh my, I hope people aren't bringing deodorant. Well, yeah, I do sometimes just so that I don't offend everybody else in my party. Um, okay, we got, uh, how do you know what areas in Idaho there are bears? So just answer that. All of Idaho is bear country. Uh, we even get bears in town here in Boise every now and then. So, uh, obviously not very often and that's a good thing. Um, but, uh, sure. Any, anytime you go out in the, out in the national forest, out in the wilderness area, you should probably have bear spray with you. Uh, two different types of bear spray depending on the species, correct? No, there's only real, one real type of bear spray. There's, uh, there's a couple different sizes of bear spray. Um, I know Counter Assault made a standard one for years, and then they, then they came out with a beefed up larger canister of spray that carries more propellant and, and more uh, uh, active ingredients. And so you have a longer spray period. The, the average uh, bear spray can lasts about eight seconds if you just hold the trigger and shoot. You got eight seconds worth of propellant in there. Uh, the bigger ones can go a little longer than that, 12 or 13 seconds. Um, we'll get to your question here in a second, Barry, about uh, encountering a bear and you don't have bear spray. Um, so this might help answer some of your questions about, um, well, we'll get to that in just a second, but here's kind of a summary of what we've already talked about, hiking in bear country, stay out of closed areas, hike with somebody else, carry your bear spray and know how to use it, make noise, <coughs> excuse me, be extra careful around that moving water, again, because bears can't hear as well around moving water, and then look for these signs when you're out and about to uh, determine whether a bear's been in the area. Okay, so bear encounters. Everybody wants to get out safely when they have a bear encounter. So I always start this part of my presentation off by saying this, remember that bears are not out there in the woods ready to pounce on you. Uh, they are much more interested in staying away from you, uh, certainly as interested in staying away from you as you are from them. So most of us will never know how close we are, were to a bear because the bear either heard us, saw us, or smelled us and ran off before we ever got to a point where we might have an encounter with that animal. Still, this is not what you want to encounter when you're out in the woods. So you're out hiking and you see a bear. When, what do you do now? Well, as I mentioned, you see the bear and you might see a glimpse of the bear because most bears are going to turn and run as soon as they figure out what you are. But let's say the bear doesn't do that. Let's say the bear does this, the bear approaches. It's probably curious. It hasn't figured out exactly what you are. <clears throat> Remember that bears don't like being around people, so they try to avoid them if they can. But if you have a situation like this, that tells me the bear doesn't know what it's up against and it's moving closer to try to figure that out. So the thing that all of us can do is give the bear options. The thing you don't want to do is corner a bear where it only has one or two options available to it, neither of which is going to be healthy for us. You want to give the bear as many options as possible. So if you can, move so that uh, your scent can drift to the bear. And once it, once it figures out, uh-oh, this is a human being, 
they're probably going to cut and run. So you can use the wind to allow your scent to drift to that bear. You want to give the bear plenty of room. Don't approach it, certainly. Um, and certainly start backing away. Um, I recommend backing away slowly, avoiding eye, con eye contact with the animal. You can watch it out of the corner of your eye. But if you stare directly at a bear, they consider that a threat in, in the world of bears. Staring directly at another bear is considered a threat. So you want to avoid that. Speaking in a low monotone, you don't want to yell and scream typically. Um, that typically gets a bear excited. So speak in a low monotone to try to let that bear know you're a human being and they don't want to have anything to do with you. You don't want to run. Um, Running can set off a predator-prey response in the bear, and they might chase you just because of that. Uh, it's not—it's a reflexive action, and people have been seriously hurt simply because they turned and ran from the bear instead of standing their ground. If that bear continues to approach, that's where you pull your bear spray, and you have it ready to deploy. And then you want to stand your ground if the bear charges. Again, don't turn and run. Um, this is advice that's a lot easier to give than it is to take, but standing your ground, uh, a bear will often bluff charge you, and it might come within a couple, three feet of you even, and then it will turn and run back to maybe where it was previously. It might charge again, bluff charge again, and turn and run again. Um, that's where having that bear spray handy, so if it does get that close, you can hit it with your spray and send it packing. If the bear does touch you, knocks you down, you want to drop to the ground and curl in a ball and lie still. Curl in a ball to protect your vital organs and you lie still because as long as you struggle, that bear is going to stay on top of you. So if you lie still and let that bear know that you're being submissive, um, it might just swat you and run away. A lot of people have, been, have avoided serious injury by following these kind of instructions. And then, of course, if you have an encounter with a bear like that, it's kind of self-evident, but you need to report that so that um, we can either uh, we can take action, Park Service can take action, whoever needs to. But it might just be as simple as closing an area for a period of time uh, just to uh, keep other people safe. So please take the time to report any kind of an encounter like this when you're out on the trail. If you see a bear, great. You don't need to report that, but if you have a serious situation like what we're talking about here, that's something you should let the authorities know about. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, don't run. Um, bears can run 35 miles an hour, and uh, you can't run 35 miles an hour on a flat track. You certainly can't run that far in a situation like this where you've got deadfall uh, all around you. So don't run. Um, people always ask me about climbing trees. Um, if you can climb a tree, great. That's a good thing to do. Um, but you need to climb fast and you need to climb high. Um, most of you probably know that black bears are very good at climbing trees. They have, they have uh, hooked claws like a cat. And so they can actually go up a limbless tree pretty easily because they are a forest dwelling bear. Uh, grizzlies on the other hand, uh, don't have that claw uh, situation, but they are still very good at climbing trees. They can climb just about any tree that you and I can climb. They can't shinny up a tree, but if it's got limbs on it, they can go up a tree very, very easily. I've seen them climb 60, 70 feet into a tree to drag somebody out that uh, has caused an issue with them. So, um, like I said, you want to climb fast and you want to climb high if you can get to a tree. If the bear charges, you gotta have your bear spray ready, right? And you deploy it like this. You don't aim directly at the bear, you aim down toward the ground uh, a little bit more so that as that bear charges, it runs through that cloud of bear spray and that will cause the issue that will cause that bear to turn and go. Um, Everybody knows that a female bear in the woods is the most dangerous bear out there, and that is a definite fact. Females with, uh, with cubs at their side are to be avoided at all costs. Um, they can be extremely protective and extremely aggressive toward anything. We've had, we've had grizzly bears that have been killed charging freight trains. 
because they considered the train a threat to their, their offspring. So certainly you and I are much less of a threat than that. And uh, it's best to avoid bears entirely, but certainly females with cubs. You want to stay away from them. Give them plenty of room. So as I mentioned, giving the bear options is what we want to do when we're out in the woods. Let the bear know what you are by allowing your scent to drift to the animal, making enough noise so that it, it can identify you as a human being. Give it plenty of room. Don't come toward it. Um, back away slowly and avoid eye contact. Speak in a low monotone. Don't run. Um, have your bear spray ready. And as I mentioned, know how to use it. Stand your ground if the bear charges. Uh, fall to the ground if you get touched by the bear. And then lastly, report uh, those kind of encounters to us or to the authorities, whoever's in charge in that area. So, okay. With that, let's see here. So am I, I, I don't, I don't do, uh, this is my first, uh, uh, Whatever program we're losing tonight. Using this your first tonight. Zoom? <laughs> yes, this is my this is my first <laughs> Zoom. Uh, <You're> right. <laughs> I use Go to Meeting a fair amount, but I've never used Zoom. So can everybody still see me? Am yeah. I on screen now? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, let's see here. Um, lots of questions. Lots of questions. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Susie, only eight seconds of spray, so you got to make it count. You don't want to you don't want to deploy your uh, your bear spray when the bear's sixty yards away. You want to wait till it's close, um, because if you don't, like I said, it's a really bad feeling to hit your spray and watch it fizzle out as the bear's continuing to approach you. Um, uh, uh, if you're on a trail and you see them go in your direction, the direction you're heading, what do you do? That's a good question, Eric. Um, I usually recommend to people that they find an alternative route or they turn around and go back. It's generally not worth the, uh, the risk to follow a bear down a trail that you've seen them go down. Um, there's a good chance that nothing's going to happen, but at the same time, if something does, it can go bad for you. So it's not generally worth the risk to do that. So I try to, I try to circumvent a bear if I can find a, figure out a way to go around it so that I don't disturb it um, and still get to where I need to go. But there are times when you just have to turn around and say, well, we're going to go somewhere else today. Um, uh, back for a second breakfast. Yeah, Chris, that's a, that's a good point. Um, bears spend their whole lives looking for things to eat and they don't forget and this is, this is serious. They do not forget a single time that they get a food reward. And that's why it's so important to keep them from getting a food reward when we're out hiking and camping in the backcountry. Because if, if a bear gets a, a food reward at a particular campground or campsite that you've been to, you pack up and leave the next day. Well, then the next person comes in behind you. They have no idea what's happened. And there's a good chance that bear's gonna come right back there and start searching around again. So somebody who's done everything maybe completely right in camp has a bear in camp because maybe the person before them did not do all the right things. So it's really important to keep those bears from getting a food reward that's human related. Uh, the old saying is that a fed bear is a dead bear and it's a truism. Um, we kill an awful lot of bears in this state, the Department of Fish and Game does, because people have habituated those animals either accidentally or on purpose to human food. And that's just not a good feeling. It's not fun to do. And uh, if everybody does their part, we can certainly reduce the number of bears that we have to kill because of that. And there's always the risk, of course, like I mentioned, that uh, if a bear comes in camp, that it could escalate and there could be more of a serious encounter than just a bear grabbing your cooler off the, the picnic table and running away with it. Uh, when do I decide to use bear spray? Daryl, I think we, we, I think we kind of touched on that. The bear is really close to you. That's when you do it. Not when it's uh, a ways away. Uh, serious bear encounters in Idaho, number of encounters with black bears versus grizzlies. Um, 
Raymond, there's probably more, uh, there's more encounters with black bears than grizzly bears, simply because there's more black bears in the state than there are grizzly bears. Um, grizzly bear encounters tend to be a little more uh, serious, as you might gather. It's important to remember that the two species are very, very different one from the other. Black bears evolved in a forest environment, so their best offense is, or their best defense is to get away. Their best defense is to run and hide in the woods. That's what they, that's what they evolved to do. Uh, whereas grizzlies, despite the fact that we've only have them in the mountains around this country, uh, they're actually a plains animal. Um, they just happen to live in the mountains because that's the last place that we've allowed them to continue to exist. Um, but their best defense is a good offense. So they are more likely to charge something that they consider to be a threat than they are to turn and run from it. Um, so the, the key there is to not let the animal figure out that you're a threat. If you, if you uh, enter their personal space, that's when you become a threat to them. If you're a ways off and you can identify yourself to that animal, they don't feel threatened, but they know this is not something I want to be around. I'm going to turn and I'm going to get out of here. Um, but serious bear encounters, we don't have a lot. You might, uh, you might have heard uh, recently we had a, a gentleman that was uh, got slightly mauled um, by a, uh, a female grizzly with cubs up in the Island Park area. And I don't know all the details about that, but it was just an encounter where he was on a trail and surprised the bear and she had cubs and that's a bad recipe. Um, normally a female with cubs or typically a female will cut with cubs will charge and maybe uh, incapacitate what she cons considers to be the threat. And then she will run off because her first concern are the cubs. So she's not interested in engaging in what she considers to be the threat for any longer than she has to because she gets injured. She knows this, she gets injured, her cubs are not gonna make it. So she will, she will neutralize the threat and then turn and go with her cubs as quickly as she can. So um, that's kind of a long answer to a short question, but this, the statistics are pretty low. Uh, I mean, you're, you're more likely to get killed by a falling coconut uh, than you are by a, a bear. And you're certainly more likely to get bitten by a New Yorker than you are a bear. So um, there's, uh, there's, there's not a lot of reason to be worried, you know, when you go out into the back country about a bear attack, but it's good to be mindful and it's good to be prepared. I, I tell people, don't be worried, but be aware of what's going on around you. Uh, let's see, how do I feel about air horns? Well, it depends on if I'm sitting at a football game and the guy next to me is using one. Um, give the kids air horns while I carried the bear spray. You know, I don't know a lot about air horns. I would think that an air horn would, uh, would be pretty effective on a bear that was a, a ways away, uh, you know, to just alert that animal that, uh, Hey, I'm out here. Uh, I don't know how good it would, I don't know how good it would be if the bear was actually charging you and you hit it with this sound that only made it more amped up. Um, not a bad idea when you got younger kids because you don't want them monkeying around with bear spray and shooting each other with it. Uh, but as soon as they are old enough to understand what it's for and how to use it, I think that's the time to let them let them use it. Um, strategy when we face a mother bear with cubs, you know what? You got to hope that you've got your uh, you got your affairs in order. Um, the best thing there is give the bear options and let them know ahead of time that you are there so that you don't surprise them. If you do, you gotta do the same things that you do with, uh, with any other bear, and that's deploy your bear spray. Um, the cubs are not gonna engage with you, only the mother will. She will communicate that to them. You stay here, I'm gonna go neutralize a threat. Uh, and so she's the only one you would have to worry about in that situation. But again, standing your ground, and having your bear spray ready, if you need it, is what you need to be doing. Uh, do bears travel in groups often? I saw two hiking Peace Creek by Silver Creek and didn't know if it was a mom and cub or just two. They were cinnamon in color. Um, yes, Eric. Um, black bears got their name, their common name, Black Bear, uh, by folks on the East Coast of the U.S. Because on the other side of the Mississippi River, Nearly every bear, every black bear in that part of the world is black. 
Uh, but out here in the West, we've got a lot of genetic diversity amongst our black bears. And so they come in all colors, blonde, cinnamon, rust color, black, brown, and combinations of those colors. So when you say black bear, people assume when they see a bear and it's not black, that, oh, that must be a grizzly bear. Well, it's not the case. Most of the time it is a black bear. It's just a different phase, color phase of black bear. Um, as far as mom and cubs, um, it probably was, but if there's a good food source there, bears typically are uh, solitary animals, except during the breeding season or a female with cubs. But um, if there's a really great food source in an area, you might see more than one bear moving around. I can remember a time when I, I glassed an area, a big field of buffalo berry from a cliff up above, and I counted 13 different black bears out in this buffalo berry patch, uh, all of them feeding on buffalo berries. But it was just such a huge resource of food there that they weren't squabbling with each other. They were just sharing and doing that, doing that kind of thing. And we do have situations where um, uh, a female grizzly um, will have her cubs and once she raises them to adulthood, uh, her female offspring, occasionally, they'll have offspring, the female will have another set of cubs, and that female, that related female, that daughter cub, will come back and join the, uh, the adult female, uh, and they'll share the responsibility for their cubs amongst each other. We've seen a little bit of that, but typically bears are pretty solitary creatures unless, uh, unless the food's really, really good somewhere. Uh, isn't it so that females will purposely hang out near human frequent areas to protect the cubs from the male bear? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand your question, Chris. You're saying that, um, you think, uh, female bears might hang out more around people because other male bears are less likely to come around that area because of the human factor. Is that what I'm, am I interpreting that right? Um, if so, I don't know. I, I don't know that there's any evidence that suggests that. Um, bears don't like being around people, period. And so I can't imagine that a female would intuitively say, I'm going to go stay by that camp because uh, I'm going to avoid male bears. Um, females do avoid males after they have offspring because it's been documented that male bears will kill uh, young cubs. So she's going to get those bear, those cubs up a tree. Young, young grizzly bears can climb trees very, very well. Uh, of course, young black bears as well. So mom's going to woof them up the tree and then she's going to go after that male if she has to. And females are, they're a, a, a real force to be reckoned with. I've seen a, a, a fairly smallish female grizzly bear, you know, maybe weighing 300 pounds, uh, fight off a big male, just chase him out of the country. And he might've outweighed her by half again as much because he just didn't want to mess with her because she was so determined to get that threat away from her cubs that he just cut and run. So I don't know that there's any, I don't know that there's any evidence that females would do what you're asking about. Bear attack, will bears attack dogs? Um, that's a good question, Emma. Um, they will occasionally. Uh, they, I tell people that when they, when they want to take their dog out, little yappy dogs, I call them, pocket dogs, you know, small dogs, um, those tend to annoy bears and keep them out of a camp. Uh, a larger dog is perceived by a bear as more of a threat. Um, in fact, if you got a moment, indulge me, I'll tell you a funny story. Years ago, a guy came in that had, was all disheveled and torn up, and I said, what happened to you? And he says, I was out bird hunting with my pointing dog, and he said, and we got to the edge of this meadow and my dog took off running across the meadow full speed. They'd been just walking along. All of a sudden, the, the dog just cut and run. And he goes all the way across the meadow, disappears on the other side into the trees. And the guy's still walking across the meadow following his dog. And then he says, the dog starts barking. He says, and then I hear this ruckus. The dog is, is barking, but it's not happy barking. And he's hearing some growling and some huffing and some other things. And then he hears his dog yipping. And the next thing he knows, his dog is coming right back toward him across the meadow with a grizzly bear about 20 feet behind him. And <laughs> I'll never forget the guy's face. He, he, he just turned and took off running back toward the truck. All right. And the dog is following him. He says, the guy said, I knew I was in trouble 
when the dog passed me. So uh, he happened to get out of that situation alive and intact, but that is one of the issues with dogs is they can sometimes cause a bear to agitate a bear to the point that they actually come after them. Whereas small yappy dogs, they don't really see them as a threat, but they don't like being around them either. They see them more of as an irritation. And so they stay, they typically stay out of camp where you've got a little yappy dog going off. So if you can stand that. So, um, Jim says, I don't want to hear air horns in the back country. I'm kind of with you, Jim. Uh, let's see. Okay, Chris, this is uh, getting back to your female thing. Could be in Teton Park. Who knows? You know, you've got a bear in that situation. It's, it's a precarious situation to have a bear living in close proximity to people. And for obvious reasons, somebody's, somebody's going to get hurt at some point. So obviously we want to discourage that kind of behavior, keep bears wild and keep them in areas where people are not typically. Um, can you hide behind a tree from a bear? Uh, I don't know that that'd be a good strategy, John. Uh, if the bear's charging, I guess is what you're asking. If the bear charges and you jump behind a tree, the bear's going to come behind the tree to get you if that's what he wants to do. Um, he knows you're there regardless. If he's that close, he knows you're there. He's either heard you, smelled you, or seen you. So he knows that you are there. Um, that's kind of an old wives tale that bears don't have very good eyesight. Their eyesight's not the best, but it's, it's pretty darn good. But their nose is really how they make their living. Uh, they spend their time looking for food, watching for danger, and they use their nose to do it. So their nose is very sensitive. And that works to our benefit as backpackers and hikers in that uh, that's why bear spray is so effective because a bear's nose is so sensitive and it is wired right to their brain. And so you hit them with that bear spray and it lights them up. They do not like it. And the great thing is they aren't, they aren't permanently harmed, but they want to get away from that stimulus. And that's why they turn and run. And they will continue to run for quite a ways um, before they finally settle down. Let's see. When backpacking, do you need to put your, hang, put your, hang your food in those special bags or can you just a dry bag suffice as long as hung correctly? Um, oh, good. Thanks, Eric. Um, Yes, uh, any, any bag will do, any, any device to put stuff in uh, and get it suspended will be fine. So yeah, if you wanna use a, a, a dry bag, if you wanna use a, maybe a, um, a back or a, a, a sleeping bag bag uh, to put your stuff in, I would not recommend that you then use your, stuff your sleeping bag in that bag the next day and continue on down the trail. Cause some of that residual uh, scent could stay on that bag and that would then be transferred to your sleeping bag, and that wouldn't be a good thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, but any any kind of container will work. Um, they they do make some special containers that you can you can buy and put your stuff in, and they're they're supposed to be bear proof. They don't necessarily have to be hung up, um, but they're supposed to uh, be impervious to bears. Um, but I got a feeling, just a sense of the group, that that's probably not a piece of equipment that most of you want to pack along when you're out hiking. So yeah, just taking a some kind of a bag that you can and a and a piece of parachute cord that you can throw over a limb and string up a tree is is a great way to do that. Uh, in some areas and other states, bear boxes are required. Yes, that's true, Chris. Um, and they're they're put there as. Uh, a convenience, at least on the uh, the Shoshone National Forest in Wyoming, we have we have bear boxes placed at key locations around the forest there, and they're big metal containers about they're four feet long, two feet square, and they've got a recessed hinge uh, hinged lid that folds down. You put all your stuff in it, close the lid, and put the clips back in place, and bears can't get into them. Uh, so it's really handy in that you don't have to go to the trouble of hanging your hanging your stuff up. Um, I did a, a winter trip looking for a, a particular bear one year, and um, we, we uh, camped at a location that had one of these boxes, and so we threw all our stuff in it. Uh, our camp was about 100 yards away, um, and uh, the next morning we got up, it, we had fresh snow on the ground, and there were grizzly bear tracks all the way around our tent. I mean, this close to the tent wall, um, which was, the pucker factor was pretty high there, but, um, we went down to get our, retrieve our gear from the box and the box was gone. 
and we looked and looked and looked and we finally we finally found it it was about 100 yards down in the bottom of a drainage so that bear picked that picked that box up and rolled it over and over and over again trying to get it open and finally gave up and went away uh might not i might not be here talking to you tonight if i'd gotten lazy and said you know what what's the chances i'm just gonna put my i'm gonna leave my food either right outside my tent or worse yet in my tent um so you always want to always 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 want to take your stuff put it in a bag and hang it that's for your protection as well as for the bear Okay, I think I've talked long enough. I've exhausted everyone. There are no more questions. I've filled everybody's brain up. So that's good. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Evan. That's a, a ton of really, really great questions. Um, as always, you know, lots of really great information about being bearware in Idaho. And yeah, I mean, they could be anywhere. And the, and, and the thing with the bear bag hanging too is there's all the other creatures that will potentially try and get into, you know, you know, mice or fox or raccoons or whatever, like they'll, they'll bite holes into your pack or try and chew a hole through your tent to get its stuff. So it's just not worth it. Take the time to, to just hang your food for all those reasons. Okay. Well, I, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Evan, Whitney, Paul, all really great information. We'll be sure to, um, put up your guys's uh, contact information, maybe on our Facebook and in our newsletter. So if other people have follow-up questions, they can email you and we'll let everybody know when this video has been posted to our YouTube channel. So you can go back and share it with your friends and family to get them more prepared for being in the backcountry, and then review it whenever you need. So with that, um, again, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you to our speakers and we'll see you next time.